Bob's Burgers stands out in the world of animated sitcoms for its refreshing take on family dynamics. Unlike many other shows filled with dysfunctional characters, this one shines with humor and heartwarming moments amidst the chaos. With its unusual comedy, lovable characters, and unique animation style, it's no wonder this series has captured the hearts of viewers worldwide. Before we begin, let's set some background for better understanding. The show revolves around the Belcher family, Bob, Linda, and their peculiar children, Tina, Jean, and Louise. They manage a hamburger restaurant in the fictional town of Seymour's Bay, New Jersey, sandwiched between a crematorium and a pizzeria owned by Bob's rival, Jimmy Pesto. Their loyal customers include Mort from the crematorium and Teddy, a dense but endearing handyman. The Belcher kids juggle school at Wagstaff School with their part-time jobs at the restaurant. Tina navigates adolescence and crushes on Jimmy Pesto Jr. Jean dreams of becoming a musician and Louise schemes of wild adventures for them all. The episodes typically follow the family's experiences running the restaurant and interacting with the eccentric members of their community. Many episodes contain musical numbers, either in fantasy sequences or as diegetic music. So without any further ado, let's begin. Season 1 in the first episode, Bob faces a flood of calamities as he reopens the restaurant for Labor Day weekend, only to forget his anniversary. Amidst chaos, health inspector Hugo accuses them of serving human flesh, fueled by Louise's rumor. Revelations of Linda's past engagement with Hugo add spice, and despite Bob's efforts, chaos escalates when Body appears. Moreover, Bob's stand against the crowd backfires, painting him as a supporter of cannibalism. Amidst public scrutiny, Bob's self-doubt spirals until Linda reassures him, affirming their shared dreams over past relationships and with Louise's apology, tensions ease. Meanwhile, Ron and Hugo test the meat, vindicating Bob. Despite a prank, he turns his scandal into profit, drawing exotic eaters. In a sweet conclusion, Bob and Linda celebrate success and love at Wonder Wharf, sealing their bond on the Ferris wheel. Bob's attempt to avoid Linda's parents backfires when he gets stuck in a crawl space, pretending it's an accident. Teddy, making his first appearance, discovers Bob's scheme but keeps quiet. As Gloria offers to help, Bob tries to escape but ends up truly trapped and later, Linda leaves him as punishment. His hallucinations worsen until Gloria finds and rescues him, ending his bizarre ordeal. Louise's scheme leads the school counselor to believe Bob has passed away, but upon discovering Bob's alive, the counselor threatens action. Luckily, Gloria intervenes, persuading him otherwise while Louise and Jean cleverly shift blame, highlighting the counselor's own negligence, ultimately sparing Bob from further trouble. Linda's secret outing to a dinner theater, disguised as a strip club visit, sparks Bob's curiosity. Discovering her true destination, he begrudgingly supports her passion for musicals. Linda's enthusiasm inspires her to host a dinner theater at the restaurant. However, Mort's over-the-top props derail the event, turning the play gory and halting the festivities. The next night, Linda's attempt at a second dinner theater is disrupted by a bank robber, who cleverly steals their money during a musical number. Despite positive feedback from customers, Bob insists on the robber's arrest and Linda, disappointed, resumes the dinner theater alone. When the robber fails to return, Bob's desperate attempt to salvage the show backfires, leaving everyone dissatisfied, mirroring the first night's outcome. With Tina's 13th birthday approaching, Linda urges Bob to make it memorable despite financial constraints. Tina dreams of a lavish party including a romantic moment with Jimmy Pesto Jr., their rival's son. Bob struggles to afford it, but at Linda's insistence, seeks an extension from their landlord, Mr. Fishoder, who instead suggests Bob drive a taxi for extra cash. As Bob takes on taxi driving, Louise becomes Tina's kissing coach for her big day with Jimmy Jr. Bob's new job introduces him to an unexpected cast of characters, including transvestite sex workers who become his friends. Meanwhile, Tina's excitement for her party dims when Jimmy Jr.'s father forbids him from attending. Bob tries to reason with Jimmy Sr., but a bizarre demand involving Bob's mustache arises. Tina, upset by the situation, agrees to a brief appearance at the party. Bob returns in a disoriented state, causing chaos at the poorly organized event. Despite the mayhem, Tina learns of Bob's efforts and reconciles with him, realizing his love and dedication. Bob sacrifices his mustache for Tina, who apologizes for her earlier outburst, realizing her father's efforts made the party special. The sex workers recall Jimmy Sr.'s peculiar habits, prompting Bob to confront him. After a tense exchange, Jimmy Sr. relents, allowing Jimmy Jr. to attend. Tina and Jimmy Jr. share a tender moment at the party, thanks to Bob's determination and Louise's encouragement, resulting in a magical kiss beneath the disco ball as, If You Were Here, by the Thompson Twins, sets the scene. The episode ends with everyone reveling in the joyous celebration. Linda's new venture of opening a bed and breakfast sparks tension with Bob, 
who worries about the family's comfort and Linda's tendencies to snap under pressure. As guests arrive, including an ethologist and a couple, Linda's enthusiasm clashes with their discomfort. She pushes them to participate in activities, but they long for a different experience. Meanwhile, Louise revels in having her room to herself, highlighting the family's divided feelings about the business. Linda invites Teddy to stay, much to Bob's unease. Linda proposes using Louise's room for Teddy, provoking Louise's wrath. Linda's attempts to involve the guests in activities backfire, particularly when Jave is preoccupied with his insects and Tina. Meanwhile, Louise issues a stern ultimatum to Teddy. Later, Linda discovers unexpected activities among the guests, while Louise enacts her revenge by unleashing Javid's beetles in Teddy's room. Teddy's encounter with the beetles shocks the family, leading Linda to blame Louise and ground her. Louise, overhearing Teddy's fear of costume characters, retaliates by ordering a legion of them to the restaurant. Linda, determined to please Teddy, locks the other guests in their rooms and orders Bob to cater to Teddy's every whim. Chaos follows as Teddy fights off the costume characters, leading to a tense standoff, but Bob resolves the situation and Linda realizes her mistake. Louise's intervention saves the day as she frees the trapped guests, bringing a resolution to the chaotic ordeal. Bob faces a crisis when Mr. Fiskoder warns that Jimmy Pesto plans to replace the restaurant with a gift shop unless rent is paid promptly. Complicating matters, Tina harbors feelings for Jimmy Jr. while Louise befriends the Pesto twins, conflicting with Bob's feud with Jimmy. As tensions escalate, the Belchers seek creative solutions to raise funds, including live music, slow dancing, and unconventional methods like voodoo. Amidst the chaos, Jimmy's attempt to copy Bob's burger fails, providing a glimmer of hope for the struggling restaurant. As the rent deadline looms, Louise's voodoo plan to manipulate Jimmy Pesto's mind intersects with Tina's desire to reconnect with Jimmy Jr. and Jean's aspiration for a music gig. Louise crafts voodoo dolls with potato heads, enlisting the Pesto twins' help to gather hair samples. Meanwhile, Bob enlists Tina and Jean to distribute half-price flyers, inadvertently prompting Jimmy Pesto to offer discounted food, draining Bob's customers. In a desperate bid, Bob concocts the challenging meat a burger to lure patrons back, employing Jean to entice them with samples at Jimmy Pesto's, hoping to reclaim their loyalty. Louise's voodoo scheme takes an unexpected turn when she lands Jean a gig at Jimmy Pesto's by fabricating a story about mustache cancer donations. Jean's dream comes true as he performs with Louise on drums while Tina reconnects with Jimmy Jr. Linda, proud of Jean's milestone, joins the audience. Meanwhile, Bob, in a desperate bid to reclaim customers, engages in a brawl with Jimmy outside the restaurant. However, Mr. Fiskoder's arrival brings a surprising turn of events. Impressed by Bob's commitment to quality, he extends the lease despite the missed rent. The episode ends in a triumphant moment as Jean plays music, Tina dances with Jimmy Jr., and Louise realizes the power of her voodoo, bringing joy to all and a setback for Jimmy Pesto Sr. Season 2 Bob's attempt to negotiate his overdue loan fails as he returns to the restaurant just as a bank robbery unfolds nearby. Sergeant Bosco enlists Bob's help to provide food for the robbers, who demand pizza from Jimmy Pesto's. Disappointed, Bob is compelled to serve burgers at the bank, turning the crisis into a marketing opportunity with Tina's dubious logo and design. When the police's plan to snipe the robbers fails, Bob finds himself a reluctant hostage by a low-level criminal named Mickey. Meanwhile, Louise cunningly gathers information from the robber, leading to a daring escape plan orchestrated by Jean. As the police devise a new plan involving tear gas, Bob tries to reason with Mickey, who confesses he's never pulled off a job without his friend Rodney. Desperate, Mickey contacts Rodney for assistance, but to no avail. Bob proposes a plan to lure everyone to his restaurant, including Mickey, offering him a burger as a final gesture of goodwill. When tear gas fills the bank, chaos ensues and Mickey attempts a daring escape, only to be apprehended by the police outside Bob's burgers. Despite Bob's protests, the banker accuses him of theft when a dye pack explodes in his pocket. Two weeks later, Mickey reaches out to inquire about Louise's report, unaware she never submitted it, and Bob, wanting to spare Louise, lies about her grade, claiming it to be excellent. Bob's pride takes a hit when Jimmy Pesto humiliates him by topping his high score in the Burger Boss video game. Determined to redeem himself, Bob becomes obsessed with reclaiming his title, neglecting his responsibilities, and even injuring himself in the process. Linda, fed up with Bob's fixation, sends the game away, but Bob tracks it down at a local arcade. With his kids in town under false pretenses, Bob sets out to reclaim his glory, leading to a series of misadventures as they navigate the arcade world. Amidst Bob's desperate attempts to reclaim his burger boss glory, he strikes a deal with Daryl, agreeing to confront Daryl's bullies in exchange for gaming lessons. 
However, Bob's reliance on painkillers backfires, resulting in a surreal encounter with Tyler, transformed into a chicken leg in his drug state. Meanwhile, the kids' boredom leads them to wreak havoc at the yacht club, culminating in a chaotic showdown that draws Linda's anger. Confronting Jimmy Pesta over the fallout, Linda condemns the absurd rivalry, leaving the club members to ponder Jimmy's membership fate while she reels from the day's chaos. Later, Daryl pays a visit to the restaurant validating Bob's view of Linda's knockers. Afterwards, Bob, finding peace with the Bobby Suex inscription, shares a heartfelt moment with Linda, but after she leaves, he secretly pays some cash to Daryl to erase the high score from the leaderboard. Bob reluctantly buys a food truck after Randy's suggestion, depleting his children's college funds in the process. Despite setbacks, Randy advises Bob on how to boost business. Linda's reckless driving lands them at the Lollapa Foods at Festival, where Bob's truck gains traction with deceptive marketing. However, the kids' lies backfire, sparking chaos and jeopardizing Bob's newfound success. Amidst escalating chaos at the festival, Bob receives an award, further enraging customers upon discovering the deceit. As they flee the angry mob, they attempt to salvage the truck, only for it to explode, leaving them stranded. Walking home with Randy's grumbling, they encounter Teddy eagerly awaiting Bob's return, unaware of the day's misfortune. As the family works at the restaurant, Gail surprises them with gifts, sparking a jawbreaker challenge between Jean and Louise. Meanwhile, Bob, under the influence of medication, mistakes Gail for Linda, leading to a mistaken intimate encounter. When Bob learns the truth, he confesses to Linda, who reacts surprisingly positively, reflecting on her own past romantic entanglements. After finding out, Bob decides to bring the family up to Dr. Yap's cabin, hoping to get Gail to fall in love with the dentist. Unfortunately, his plan to set her up with Dr. Yap backfires hilariously, with Linda misunderstanding the situation and accusing Bob of infidelity. Amidst dental mishaps and mistaken intentions, Linda realizes her error and reconciles with Bob. Season 3, Morse Funeral for Horny Dave, brings chaos when his biker gang, the One-Eyed Snakes, descends on Bob's burgers. Meanwhile, Louise's beloved bunny ears are stolen by a skateboarding team named Logan. Desperate to retrieve them, she marks on a wild quest, resorting to bribery, stalking, and ultimately tattling on Logan to his parents. Despite her efforts, the bunny ears are lost forever, leaving her devastated. Soon, Louise's quest for revenge leads to a chaotic showdown between Logan's family and the one-eyed snakes at Bob's Burgers. Tensions escalate until Munflap, a member of the gang, goes into labor, revealing that Critter is the father. Amidst the chaos, Logan's dad delivers the baby with the help of everyone present. With the baby's arrival, peace is restored, though Louise and Logan are disappointed that their anticipated fight never happens. Despite this, she is content to have her bunny ears back. Bob reluctantly agrees to let the Belchers be part of Mr. Fishhooter's fake family for Thanksgiving, lured by the offer of five months' rent. Disheartened by the decision, Bob realizes he'll miss their cherished Thanksgiving traditions like playing football with Jean, breaking the wishbone with Tina, and investigating turkey organs with Louise. Fishhooter plans to impress Shelby Schnabel, a serial homewrecker, by presenting a seemingly happy family. Despite his reservations, Bob accepts knowing the financial gain will help the restaurant. On Thanksgiving at Fishcoder's mansion, Bob and the Belchers play their roles in the fake family charade. Linda, in her old bridesmaid dress, leaves with her Thanksgiving song. Bob plans activities for everyone, including a toast in the kitchen at 8. Fishcoder segregates Bob to the back, leaving him alone with Lance the turkey. Meanwhile, the kids dress up and perform as another family. Fishcoder incentivizes their act with arcade tickets, sparking competition among them. Bob, hallucinating after absinthe, converses with Lance while Shelby, Fistroder's love interest, arrives, adding tension. Jean, Louise, and Tina navigate the charade, as Shelby's presence complicates matters. Bob's attempts to engage the family fatal as they prioritize earning arcade tickets. In a drunken stupor, he burns himself retrieving the wishbone and falls asleep, imagining a perfect family moment. He wakes late, realizing he missed the toast. Linda enters, focused on the performance, and Bob, upset insists on giving his toast in the dining room. As Bob's drunken antics escalate, he disrupts Fishhooter's dinner, delivering a toast alongside him. In a fit of rage, Bob absconds with the turkey, making Fishhooter's offer tainted. Pursued by Shelby, Bob takes refuge in the attic, where he's mistakenly shot only to be saved by Lance. Amidst the chaos, Bob's drunken delusions lead to a bizarre revelation about his conversation with the turkey. Linda confesses the game plan to Shelby, who, though touched, rejects Fishhooter's advances. The family salvages the evening with a peculiar portrait prize and a dinner of Lance reflecting on their unconventional Thanksgiving. Bob decides to let Tina get behind the Weedle, and she manages to hit the only other car in the parking lot. 
The car ends up being Jimmy's, who files a claim against Bob, so Bob convinces Tina to lie to the insurance agent Chase Kaminsky so that he doesn't get in trouble for letting an underage girl drive his car. After recording Bob and Tina's story of what happened, Chase invites Bob to his barbecue to cook on the grill. Bob leaves Tina alone with it, and the grill catches on fire and burns down Chase's house. When Tina becomes overrun in guilt about lying, they come clean to Chase, who reveals that he knew they were lying and secretly used them to burn down his house, which he had insured for twice as much as it was worth. Chase begins to blackmail Bob with the information about his car insurance fraud to get him to help him commit multiple other insurance frauds, such as flooding Bob's basement. They are finally able to resolve the situation when Tina uses Jean's keyboard to record Chase planning his next scheme. Tina faces challenges in her role at the Wagstaff School News, overshadowed by Tammy's manipulations. Determined to make an impact, Tina uncovers a story about a serial defecator, dubbing them the Mad Pooper. Launching her own news segment, Tina News, she gains traction, but draws ire from Mr. Grant and Tammy. Matters get worse when WSN implicates Tina in the defecation incidents, leading to her being sent to the principal's office. Tina confronts the Mad Pooper during an assembly, only to discover it's Zeke, who staged the incidents to boost Tina News popularity. Louise orchestrates a prank involving Tammy and a falling turd, shifting attention away from Zeke's actions. WSN apologizes to Tina and she's given her own segment, The Tina Table. Meanwhile, Louise tricks Jean into impersonating Bob, impressing Linda but unsettling Bob. As the family rushes to Tina's aid at the assembly, Jean's desire for bathroom humor leads to his reversion to his true self, much to Bob's relief and Linda's disappointment because she will miss her Muppet baby Bobby. In this episode, a mysterious crate falls off a truck, revealing a talking toilet named Chet. Jean befriends Chet, but the truck driver, Yuli, claims ownership. The truck driver, who introduces himself as Max Flush, announces that his toilet costs $14,000 and that he's very motivated to locate it. He becomes crazier and proceeds, staking out Bob's restaurant where Jean hides it. With the help of the Pesto Kids and Zeke, they relocate the toilet. Meanwhile, Bob and Linda in borrowed finery enjoy free drinks but get too drunk to order food. They find Jean and the toilet on the road and end up in a coffee shop. Later, Max reveals himself as a toilet thief attempting to escape, but he is caught by the kids. Chet, the toilet, returns to its owner as Bob faces consequences for the borrowed suit, while Jean bids farewell tearfully. Tina plans to attend the boys' four now concert with Aunt Gail or Dash when Gail's cat emergency arises. Louise, initially relieved, eventually agrees to help Tina get to the concert. Along the way, they meet Zeke and his cousin Leslie, who are selling bootleg t-shirts and hot dogs. Tina tries to engage Louise in fan talk, but Louise remains indifferent until they reach the concert. There, Louise becomes enamored with Boo Boo, a member of Boys 4 now, after he removes his helmet. After the concert, Louise struggles with her feelings for Boo Boo, attempting to deny her crush but failing to do so. She and Tina try to sneak backstage but end up hiding in the Boys 4 now tour bus instead. When the bus heads to Alabama, Louise's infatuation intensifies, especially when she sees Boo Boo and Booster Seat cue to his weight. Despite her initial embarrassment, Louise finally meets Boo Boo, though she's speechless until she impulsively slaps him. They're promptly kicked off the bus and picked up by Aunt Gail. Later, Louise secretly cherishes a photo of Boo Boo, reflecting on her unforgettable encounter with the band. At the competitive table-setting regionals, Jean impresses the judges with his Dump Up the Volume piece, securing a spot in the finals. However, faced with the unexpected requirement for a second table, Jean improvises using items from Linda's purse, creating a menstruation-themed table he dubs Menstruant. The shocking display, featuring tampons and maxi pads with strawberry jam, appalls the judges, leading to Jean's defeat. Nonetheless, he takes solace in the fact that the overly competitive father son duo also lost. Season 4, on Halloween, Tina, Jean, Louise, and the Pesta twins plan a candy grabbing scheme using a Chinese dragon costume. However, they get trapped in their cardboard fort by a truck blocking the entrance. They're rescued by Louise's classmate, Millie, who then unwittingly prolongs their captivity with her incessant chatter. Louise's frustration peaks, causing her to lash out at Millie. As they remain stuck, tensions rise among the group. As the day wears on, Millie's antics escalate, causing further distress among the trapped kids. Louise's attempt to escape via a cardboard passage reveals a dumpster, but Millie sabotages Ollie's escape attempt. It's revealed that Daryl betrayed them in exchange for candy and a restroom break. As night falls, Bob and Linda search for their missing children, bissled by Millie's deception into believing they already left. As Daryl tries to free them with a wire hanger, he accidentally activates the truck's ramp, threatening to crush the fort. They brace the structure with makeshift barriers but find the neighborhood dark upon escape. Back home, they decide to indulge in Bob and Linda's candy stash, 
prompting Tina to reconsider her stance on trick or treating. Millie stumbles upon the wreckage and believes she's caused harm. The Belcher kids trick Millie into surrendering her candy, relishing in their victory atop the truck. In the end, they enjoy Millie's sweets, triumphant in their Halloween adventure. Linda's old band, the Tetas, is invited to perform at her high school reunion. Despite initial reservations, Linda convinces herself to do it. Bob stays home due to a pimple, while Tina is upset Jen is babysitting. At the reunion, Bob's pimple treatment becomes popular. Bad Hair Day, the band that defeated the Tatas in high school, arrives late but is scheduled to perform first. The disagreement with Gail leads to Linda having a breakdown and leaving during the Tatas performance. Tina, Louise, and Jean are upset about missing the reunion, so they scheme to threaten Jen to take them there. In the process, Tatina gets a black eye. To protect Jen, they all give themselves black eyes. Jen convinces Linda to perform and the Tatas play one of Gail's songs, which is a success. As they leave, they see Gail making out with the guy the song was about, bringing closure to the situation. Tina is initially excited about Bob substituting as the home economics teacher, hoping to become the teacher's pet. However, she's disappointed when Zeke gains Bob's favor with his cooking skills. Bob transforms the class into a restaurant with Zeke as head chef. Feeling sidelined, Tina switches to shot class to vie for attention. Meanwhile, Bob is impressed by Zeke's talent and determination. As the restaurant gains popularity, Zeke shines as the star chef. Tina's jealousy drives her to compete for attention in shot class, highlighting her desire for recognition. As Bob faces pressure to shut down the home ex restaurant due to conflicts with the school cafeteria's contract, the students rally behind him, demonstrating their support by staging a popcorn protest. Determined to go out with a bang, Bob and the students create a mobile hamburger stand. However, Bob realizes Tina transferred due to feeling neglected. He apologizes and Tina rejoins them for the final meal. Despite resistance from Kafko, the hamburger cart's popularity prevails. Meanwhile, Linda teaches Teddy to dance for a wedding, where he impresses but gets sick in the bounce house as the Belchers face a series of mishaps with their Christmas trees, including one dying on Christmas Eve, they embark on a last-minute hunt for a replacement. Meanwhile, Teddy falls victim to one of Louise's traps meant for Santa, leaving him trapped under the refrigerator. On their way to find a tree, they narrowly avoid a collision with a truck disguised as a candy cane, which later appears to pursue them menacingly. Bob tries to alert the authorities, but his concerns are dismissed. The family seeks refuge at a diner, where they encounter further oddities. Despite Bob's insistence, the others brush off the bizarre events as coincidences, leaving him feeling frustrated and perplexed. In a dramatic turn, the candy cane truck continues its pursuit, prompting the Belchers to seek refuge in the woods after their car becomes stuck in the snow. With no means of communication, tensions rise as they face the looming threat. However, their fears are quelled when they confront the truck's driver, Gary, a lonely man overwhelmed by the pressures of his Christmas duties. Bob's empathy diffuses the situation, leading to a heartwarming exchange. Grateful for the gesture of kindness, Gary assists the Belchers and receives a thoughtful gift in return. As they return home, they are relieved to find Teddy safe and share in the holiday spirit with a heartwarming moment. Tina, Jean, Louise, and Linda attend Equestra Con, a convention for fans of Tina's favorite show, The Equestronauts. Bob refuses, unaware that it's popular among adult men dubbed Equesticles. Tina feels awkward amidst middle-aged male fans in horse costumes. She befriends Bronconius, a superfan, who tricks her into trading her prized chariot doll. Louise overhears his deceit and informs Tina. The Belchers discover Tina's chariot doll is valuable due to a rare defect. Tina plans for Bob to retrieve it by disguising it as an equestical, Bob Cephala. Bob reluctantly agrees and extensively studies the series. At the convention, Bob impresses Bronconius with his knowledge and joins equestical activities. Meanwhile, Tina finds her non-canonical fanfiction in Bob's study materials and fears it will expose his disguise. She races to stop Bob from mentioning it. At a hotel after party, Bob learns the chariot doll's location from Bronconius, who plans to merge with it for immortality. Bob inadvertently exposes himself by mentioning a character from Tina's fanfiction. The family arrives to rescue Bob from Bronconius' bizarre plans. Tana convinces the other equesticals to turn against Bronconius, highlighting his manipulation. They recover the doll from his safe, but Tina decides to move on from it. Despite Bob's frustration, Tina plays with the doll one last time before storing it away. Louise's fear of the dentist sends her fleeing from Dr. Yap's office, seeking refuge in Aunt Gail's apartment. With Linda's call, her secret hideout is exposed, prompting Jean and Tina to contemplate their own escape plans. Despite Louise's attempts to maintain her independence, her family's concern ultimately prevails. 
As they converge at Aunt Gail's, a sense of solidarity emerges, reminding Louise that she is not alone in facing her fears. Bob and Linda challenge Louise to endure a weekend with Gail's eccentricities, betting that she won't last. Jean and Tina join in, conspiring with Linda to orchestrate bizarre scenarios to test Louise's resolve. Despite the antics, Louise perseveres until she experiences tooth pain while enjoying ice cream. Confronted by her family's intervention, Louise admits her fear of the dentist. In a heartwarming twist, the family, including Gail, rallies around Louise to address her fear. They stage a playful espionage mission at Dr. Yap's office, easing Louise's anxiety and allowing her to finally undergo the necessary dental treatment. Through love and support, Louise conquers her fear, strengthening familial bonds in the process. Season 5, The Belchers and Courtney Wheeler, along with her father Doug, argue their case to Mr. Frond about which musical to produce at Wagstaff's annual production. Gene pitches his musical adaptation of Die Hard, but Courtney proposes Working Girl instead, with Doug's resources backing her. Gene accuses Courtney of stealing his idea, calling Working Girl the sassy sister film to Die Hard. Doug seals the deal by promising to bring Carly Simon, who sang the film's theme song to the production. Ms. LeBond, a Carly Simon fan, chooses Working Girl, the musical on the spot. Louise suggests to Jean that they stage a guerrilla slash protest production of Die Hard, the musical on the same night as Courtney's Working Girl, the musical in the school boiler room. They recruit rejected students for the Die Hard cast and begin rehearsals. However, Jean is unsatisfied with their performances and decides to perform the entire show himself on the night before the production. Louise distributes flyers for Die Hard during Working Girl, attracting the audience's attention. Bob and Linda support both shows, but the crowd shifts to Die Hard, injuring Doug when he discovers Jimmy Pesto sneaking out to watch it. Furious, Doug interrupts Die Hard by throwing one of Courtney's shoulder pads at Gene, hitting him in the face. In the present, Mr. Fron convenes the Belchers and the Wheelers due to the chaos caused by the competing musicals. He decides to cancel both performances, deeming musical theater too dangerous. Gene, seeing his classmates' disappointment, relinquishes the stage to Courtney's production. Courtney admits her motive for doing Working Girl and reconciles with Gene, proposing a collaboration. They merge their productions into Work Hard or Die Trying Girl with Mr. Frun's reluctant approval. Ms. LeBond reprimands Doug for his deceit, paraphrasing, You're so vain. The new play merges characters from Working Girl and Die Hard, with Tess and her colleagues held hostage by Hans Gruber and John McClane working to save them. Tessa's ambition wins over Gruber, leading to an unexpected kiss between Jean and Courtney. Catherine and Jack find love, and McLean defeats Gruber. The audience adores the finale, bringing them to their feet and moving Doug to tears. In the closing credits, Carly Simon joins the cast for a reprise of the closing number, adding to the magic of the evening. As detention unfolds, Mr. Fron organizes a fashion contest, Scared Fabulous, inspired by the fashion conflict that led to the detention. Teams compete for an early release with Tammy and Jocelyn, Zeke and Jimmy Jr. and the Belcher siblings facing off. Tina and Tammy strike a side bet involving their sparkly jelly bracelet. Three challenges are set, judged by Coach Blevins, Secretary Schnur, and Custodian Branca, the only staff present. As tensions rise, creativity and rivalries clash in a bid for freedom and bracelet ownership. In the first challenge, Tammy and Jocelyn impress by designing an outfit for Ms. Schnur using office supplies, securing their spot in the next round. The second challenge involves creating outfits for Coach Blevins, with Zeke and Jean wrestling to determine the winner. However, Principal Spore's disapproval halts the competition. Disheartened, Mr. Frond suggests they return to class, but the kids challenge him to a final showdown. If Mr. Frond wins, they promote Scared Fabulous to the principal. If the kids win, they leave early. The ultimate challenge is judged by Mr. Branca, demanding presidential speech attire made from trash. Tina and Tammy's gesture of giving up their jelly bracelets helps complete their team's outfit, securing their victory over Mr. Frond. Despite his initial frustration, Mr. Frond interprets it as a sign of reconciliation, attributing it to his fashion program. However, Principal Spore's unexpected visit prompts Mr. Frond to set off the fire alarm as a distraction. Meanwhile, Bob and Linda deal with a neighborhood girl, Sally, selling magazine subscriptions for a potentially fraudulent fundraiser. Trish, the fundraiser's organizer, Pressures them into buying 20 magazines, but Bob turns the tables on Jimmy Pesto, who ends up purchasing 40 magazines, leaving Bob and Linda satisfied despite the scam. As Linda's frustration mounts on her birthday, she encounters a series of irritating events, including a slow line at the grocery store and getting stuck between two large vehicles in the parking lot. In a final blow, she splits her pants while trying to enter her car, inadvertently locking her keys and phone inside. Feeling defeated, Linda sits on the curb, contemplating her unfortunate birthday turn of events. Bob and the kids frantically search for her. Unable to locate her at the grocery store or the bakery, 
They expand their search to places Linda frequents, like the Royal Oyster Hotel and a pet shop. Despite their efforts, they are unable to find her and grow increasingly worried. Meanwhile, Linda's attempts to return home become a comedy of errors as she navigates public transportation and encounters further obstacles. Amidst her series of unfortunate events, Linda encounters more obstacles on her journey home, including being sprayed by a skunk, breaking her glasses, and hitchhiking in a horse trailer. When she encounters the Chalk of the Town festival blocking her path, she gets into a confrontation with a woman from the grocery store. Unable to enter the festival without a ticket, Linda dashes through the sidewalk chalk displays pursued by the woman. She finally loses her pursuer by leaping over a display, allowing her to return home. Unable to enter through conventional means, Linda breaks into her own apartment, relieved to finally be home after her eventful birthday odyssey. She finds out that Bob and the kids have prepared a homemade spa day at the apartment for her. Bob tells her that he learned a lot about her today, and that he's happy to find that he is still finding out new things about his wife after being married all these years. He tells her he's sorry her birthday was terrible, but Linda replies that it was the best birthday ever, showing her that she still has spunk even while getting older. Linda even says she wants this to be a new tradition on her birthday. Every year on her birthday, Bob and the kids would have to blindfold her and drop her somewhere with no cell phone or money, and she would find a way home herself. Bob leads a rent strike against Mr. Fishcoder's rent hike. Fishcoder proposes a water balloon fight offering rent reductions for the winners. Despite Bob's reluctance, the tenants eagerly participate. Jean and Louise gather more balloons while Sal, initially convinced by Bob, betrays him under Jimmy Pesto's influence. Linda's sacrifice inspires Bob to fight for victory, using her bra as a launcher. In the heat of the water balloon fight, Bob and Linda's kids, Jean and Louise, utilize Linda's bra as a makeshift weapon, aiding them in reaching an extravagant tree fort inhabited by Fishcoder's brother, Felix. As the competition dwindles down to Bob, Tina, and Jimmy Pesto with his twins serving as human shields, tensions rise. Bob criticizes the participants for playing into Fishcoder's scheme, prompting a change in the game's rules. Now hitting Bob results in rent deductions for the attacker increases for Bob, prolonging the contest until sundown. In a heartfelt turn of events, Bob's family and the tenants rally to his defense, highlighting his altruistic intentions. When faced with the opportunity to pelt Bob, the tenants opt to unite against Fishcoder's unfair rent hikes, smashing their balloons in solidarity. Recognizing Bob's sincerity, Fishcoder postpones the rent increase. In a reconciliatory gesture, Bob apologizes to Fishcoder, prompting a resolution. The community, including Fishcoder, comes together for a celebratory water balloon fight, symbolizing their newfound unity and camaraderie. Season 6. Bob and Linda, aiming to scare their children on Halloween, take them to a haunted house, but fail to frighten them. Disappointed, Louise decides to turn the tables and scare her parents instead. Hiding in the garden, the children startle Bob and Linda as they emerge from a pile of leaves. As they prepare to leave, they discover a flat tire and encounter a mysterious figure holding hedge trimmers outside. Unnerved by the silent stranger, they retreat indoors, unsure of his intentions. The power outage and strange sounds prompt the Belchers to investigate the basement, where they encounter eerie phenomena. A terrifying cry sends them scrambling upstairs, only to be confronted by the menacing man with shears at the front door. Seeking refuge, they barricade themselves in the bathroom, but eerie occurrences continue. As their distress mounts, hooded figures appear outside, and the lawn seemingly ignites. Trapped and terrified, Louise realizes it's all a prank orchestrated by her family, including Jean's staged photo capturing her fear. Relieved and amused, Louise joins in the Halloween fun. The mystery behind the haunting is unveiled. Teddy deflated the tire, Moore's back injury caused the eerie sounds, and the scare tactics were orchestrated by Moore's mother's boyfriend. Grateful for the thrilling Halloween prank, Louise expresses her appreciation to her family. As they return home, they reminisce over their spooky adventure and unwind by watching a music video, concluding their eventful Halloween night. Bob's injury leads to financial strain, prompting the Belchers to explore legal options. Advised by a nurse to seek compensation from Gyro for the accident, they visit a lawyer who proposes a negotiation strategy. However, Gyro surprises them by offering his healing services instead, claiming to be a healer. Skeptical yet desperate, Bob agrees to let Gyro attempt to heal his torn labrum. Gyro demonstrates his abilities by improving Bob's mobility, leaving the Belchers hopeful but wary of his unconventional methods. In a gamble for Bob's recovery, they embark on a unique healing journey with Gyro. Bob reluctantly attends his healing sessions with Gyro, initially skeptical, but gradually noticing improvements in his mobility and well-being. Meanwhile, the kids, inspired by Bob's legal pursuit, attempt their own schemes using fake law firm letters. As Bob becomes more immersed in Gyro's healing practices, 
He invites him to stay with the family after learning of his housing struggles. However, Bob's newfound tranquility and unconventional lifestyle clash with the family's routine, leading to tension. When Jaro's advice pushes Bob to neglect his responsibilities, the family's patience wears thin. Amidst their struggles, the kid's deception is exposed, adding to the chaos. As Bob finds his creative spark again with the running out of fine burger, Jaro becomes increasingly concerned about Bob's stress levels. Bob, however, sees his challenges as invigorating rather than burdensome. Meanwhile, the kids intervene with Fischoder to help Jero regain his apartment. Threatening to expose Fischoder's past actions, they successfully negotiate Jero's return. Before leaving, Jero holds one final class in the Belcher basement. With Jero's departure, Bob rediscovers the balance between facing challenges and finding peace, grateful for the lessons learned during their time together. As the situation escalates, more students arrive at the nurse's office. Tina takes charge. Liz quarantines the office and Tina and Liz don rubber gloves on their heads for protection. Using the school's television station, they alert other students to come for examinations. Meanwhile, Louise, initially feigning illness to avoid a quiz, finds herself trapped in the quarantine. The chaotic situation unfolds as Tina and Liz work to contain the lice outbreak and ensure everyone receives proper treatment. As chaos ensues, Liz resorts to drastic measures, insisting on shaving the infected kids' heads and burning their hats. The children, particularly Louise, resist, fearing the loss of their hair and cherished possessions. Mr. Fron intervenes, but Liz is determined to contain the outbreak. Tina discovers Mr. Fron's infection and inadvertently causes Liz to shave her own head. In the midst of the commotion, the students flee the office with Louise and Tammy seeking refuge in the school library. There, Louise seeks knowledge about lice, hoping to find a solution to their predicament. As Louise and Tina devise a plan to escape Liz's lice quarantine, Louise pretends that Tammy actually has dandruff using the information from the medical encyclopedia. Tina notices Liz's reliance on her glasses and points out her inability to read without them, exposing Liz's deception. With Liz admitting to fabricating the lice outbreak, the children are freed from the nurse's office. Meanwhile, Bob and Linda struggle with new bar stool cushions that emit fart noises. When a man plans a funeral meal at the restaurant, they desperately try to break in the cushions. Following Mike the Mailman's suggestion, they offer free beer to patrons who help break in the cushions, eventually resolving the issue. As Bob struggles to free himself from the super-strong adhesive, the kids realize the severity of the situation and attempt to help him. However, their efforts only make things worse as they accidentally spread the adhesive to other surfaces. With the interview looming, Bob's stress intensifies as he remains stuck. Meanwhile, the Coasters Magazine team arrives, eager to conduct the interview. Despite the chaos, Bob tries to maintain his composure and salvage the situation, hoping to avoid embarrassment and salvage his chance at being featured in the magazine. As the situation grows increasingly dire, eventually after a tense and messy struggle, Bob is finally freed from the toilet seat. Despite the chaos and embarrassment, Bob's relief at being liberated is palpable, and the family celebrates their victory over the sticky situation. Amidst the chaos, Bob's outburst and Louise's confession catch the attention of the Coasters crew, who have a change of heart. Impressed by the family's resilience and unity, they decide to feature Bob and the restaurant in their article after all, believing that such an eventful and spirited establishment is indeed a hidden gem worth showcasing. Bob's sense of pride and relief is palpable as the ordeal comes to an end, and he finally manages to stand up, earning cheers and applause from the supportive crowd. It's a bittersweet moment for Bob as he reads through the magazine and sees the unexpected feature on his restaurant. Despite the embarrassing photo and the reminder of the toilet incident, he's grateful for the positive spotlight on Bob's burgers and the potential boost in business it could bring. The acknowledgement of his efforts to run a successful business and integrate into the community is validating, even if it comes with a humorous twist. With renewed optimism, Bob looks forward to welcoming new customers and sharing the story behind the quirky fame that landed him in Coasters Magazine. Season 7 as the Halloween costume contest approaches, Tana becomes increasingly convinced of her newfound witch status after casting spells with mixed results. However, when Jackie the Crossing Guard retaliates with a curse, Tina seeks guidance from Mr. Ambrose, who reveals Jackie's true nature as an evil witch. Fearing the consequences of the curse, Tana relies on her siblings Jean and Louise for protection during the contest. Despite the challenges, Tina remains determined to prove herself and win the competition, even if it means facing off against Jackie's dark magic. With her newfound confidence and support for her family, Tina prepares to confront whatever challenges lie ahead in her quest for victory. As Tina realizes the truth about witchcraft and publicly apologizes to Jackie, she renounces her involvement in spells. The costume contest ends with regular-sized Rudy emerging as the winner. Meanwhile, 
Bob investigates the theft of his burger-themed jack-o'-lantern, suspecting Jimmy Pesto, but later discovers his landlord, Mr. Fishoder, is behind it. Mr. Fishoder reveals a collection of stolen pumpkins at his mansion, impressing the Belcher family. Despite the initial mystery, the evening ends on a positive note as they admire the pumpkins and take photos with them, appreciating their newfound beauty in a different setting. As the Belchers immerse themselves in the holiday spirit, Bob's tasked with an unexpected challenge by Mr. Fishoder, who enlists him to participate in a gingerbread house contest. Meanwhile, Linda leads the family and Teddy on a festive caroling adventure through the suburbs, encountering both chilly receptions and heartwarming surprises. Despite initial fears about a neighbor's sinister reputation, they discover Oscar to be a warm-hearted soul who invites them into his home for comforting hot cocoa. As Bob contemplates his role in the contest and the potential rewards, the Belcher's Christmas unfolds with a blend of unexpected twists and heartening encounters. Amidst the gingerbread house contest chaos, Bob's integrity shines as he stands up to Mr. Fiskoder's jealousy-fueled antics, ultimately winning the competition with his resilient spirit. Despite the destruction, Bob's heartfelt gesture of sharing the Cuddle Session Prize with his family and unexpected guests showcases the true meaning of Christmas, unity, and togetherness. In a heartwarming twist, Mr. Fiskoder and his friends are moved by Bob's sincerity, bridging divides and fostering newfound connections amidst the holiday cheer. As the Belchers and their guests revel in the joy of the season, it becomes a celebration of friendship. Valentine's Day brings a mix of emotions to the Belcher family and their classmates. Louise navigates a complex situation with regular size Rudy, realizing his crush on Chloe is one-sided and intervening to set things straight. Tyna copes with digestive issues but remains determined to fulfill her romantic plans with Jimmy Jr., resorting to stilts after her chili-induced ailment. Jean finds unexpected companionship with the cafeteria substitute kitchen lady, lending a hand in her chocolate-making endeavors. Meanwhile, Bob scrambles for a last-minute gift for Linda, leading to a spontaneous hip-hop dance performance as a heartfelt gesture of love. Despite the ups and downs, the day is filled with unconventional expressions of affection and connection. Bob plans to relive his youth by taking Jean to a rock laser show at the planetarium, while Linda and the girls visit Gretchen at her doll cell on job. At the planetarium, Bob and Jean leave early when Jean becomes overwhelmed. In the car, Bob shares memories of the show and describes the rock opera's plot to Jean. Despite missing the laser show, they bond over the music. Meanwhile, Linda and the girls have a meal at a doll-themed restaurant where Tina feels uneasy. Bob and Jean later embark on an adventure to sneak back into the show, successfully gaining entry and enjoying the finale. Linda and the girls help Gretchen disguise a discontinued doll, and Tina makes a decision to buy it, reinforcing family bonds throughout the day. At the restaurant, the Belcher family, along with Gretchen, settles in for a meal. Tina feels uneasy about her dinner doll's gaze, while Louise becomes intrigued by Tina's doll's backstory and suggests a swap. Meanwhile, outside the planetarium, Bob and Jean are denied re-entry but learn of a secret way in from a scalper, a phone number granting access to the concession stand. At the restaurant, Gretchen informs them that Tina's doll, Francine, is being discontinued, meaning it will be shredded for play area mats, disturbing Tina and Louise. Bob calls the concession stand, unsure if he's speaking to the cool or uncool Nick, and successfully gains entry instructions with a passphrase. Back at the restaurant, Louise considers buying the Francine doll or sneaking it out, but Gretchen proposes a disguise plan instead. Bob and Jean successfully sneak into the planetarium, narrowly avoiding the security guard and enjoy the laser show's thrilling finale together. Meanwhile, at the restaurant, Linda and the girls execute a plan to disguise the Francine doll as a Sabrina doll, ensuring its safety. Despite initial concerns, Louise decides to purchase the Sabrina doll, and the family celebrates their victory with air guitar performances. Season 8. The episode begins with the Belcher family considering getting a dog but ultimately deciding against it due to the associated costs and responsibilities. They notice a long line at Jimmy Pesto's restaurant and learn he's serving brunch. Inspired, the Belchers decide to offer brunch at their own restaurant. Meanwhile, Mr. Fishhooter visits the restaurant in search of Felix, who is hiding from his brother. Louise finds Felix hiding behind the dumpster and helps him evade Mr. Fishcoder's search. Bob and Linda leave to get ingredients for their brunch menu, while Louise signals Felix to hide in the restaurant's basement. Felix reveals that he's trying to break a hide-and-seek record set by his friend Calvin, offering the Belchers $250 to keep his secret. Bob prepares for brunch while the kids discover Felix hiding in the basement. Despite a successful start, the brunch crowd mainly orders mimosas, causing concern about meeting a mandatory meal minimum. Mr. Fiskoder arrives, searching for Felix, while Teddy passes out drunk. The blogger criticizes the lack of food orders and watered-down mimosas. 
As the customers get drunk, Fiskoder searches the basement but fails to find Felix, who's hiding in a costume. When the drunken customers cause a brawl, the police intervene and arrest them. A week later, the Belchers enjoy a private brunch with their friend Dalton, accompanied by his dog. Louise reads Old Yeller to help the student body win a trip to a water park by reading 500 books. Mr. Frun's dolls are mutilated, prompting him to cancel the trip until the culprit is caught. Louise accuses Millie, but Frond reveals Millie is absent due to dental surgery. The siblings visit Millie, who agrees to help solve the case in exchange for playdates. Louise and Millie investigate, but are constantly interrupted by Millie's desire to hang out. They find one doll unraveled, not cut. Zeke confesses to the crime, but another doll is destroyed, proving his innocence. Louise and Millie argue over the phone as the trip is recanceled. Louise reconciles with Millie to uncover the true culprit behind the mutilated dolls. Millie reveals that Mr. Fron was responsible. Confronted by the siblings, Fron flees his office, but they corner him and two other teachers in the lounge. The teachers confess to destroying the dolls after spending the water park money on coffee pods. They agree to restore the water park trip in exchange for not reporting them to the principal. At the water park, Louise begrudgingly acts friendly towards Millie. Meanwhile, Teddy partners with Janine to start a motivational poster business, but it fails. Bob finds inspiration in one of the posters and becomes more productive, leading them to save Teddy and Janine's business. Bob, with a broken leg, becomes intrigued by the urban legend of the Wonder Wolf while watching a news report. Linda, noticing Bob's erratic behavior due to pain pills, gives him one before Teddy, dressed as a nurse, arrives to take care of him. Bob recounts how he broke his leg while trying to put on old chef pants. As they watch the news, they become paranoid and the lack of candy distribution heightens their suspicions. They decide to investigate by going to the park where the Wonder Wolf was sighted. Meanwhile, Linda and the kids hear a howl in the park, fueling their belief in the creature's existence. Bob, still under the influence of painkillers, becomes convinced that Teddy is a werewolf and handcuffs him to a table. Linda and the kids, meanwhile, join Randy in the woods to search for the Wonder Wolf and negotiate a deal to split profits from Randy's documentary. They encounter a shadow resembling a wolf, but it turns out to be an alpaca from the petting zoo. The Fiskoders arrive to retrieve their pet, and Bob's claim of encountering a real wolf is dismissed. Despite the chaotic adventure, the kids find it fun, and Randy and Teddy decide to stay. As Linda and Bob host a Christmas party at their restaurant, they discover that the town's gay night club has been closed. In a festive spirit, Linda reproposes the top of their Christmas tree as a decoration. However, when it goes missing, they suspect theft. The police are called, but with no leads, Linda and Bob interrogate their guests to no avail. Meanwhile, their daughter Louise suspects the Bleakin, a mythical creature said to steal from bad children. Alongside Tina and Jean, she investigates, finding a map of the town's crime scenes at the police station. Louise triangulates a potential location for the Bleakin's lair based on the map, hoping to recover the stolen items. After a tense search in the abandoned warehouse, the Belcher family discovers clues pointing to the Bleakin's lair, including Jean's ornament and black feathers. They uncover a hidden door leading downstairs where they encounter strange noises. Bob and Louise investigate further and stumble upon a hidden staircase, leading them to a Christmas grave with stolen decorations. Linda confronts the revelers, expressing her dismay at the thefts and the lack of Christmas spirit. The ravers explain that the rave is a replacement venue for the closed nightclub and the hidden entrance was to avoid detection. Despite the misunderstanding, the stolen decorations are returned and the family shares a moment of relief and reconciliation amidst the festive chaos. As the police arrive, Art admits to stealing the decorations for the rave. Bob, donning a bleak in costume, leads the officers away to prevent the rave from being shut down. Meanwhile, Teddy, hiding in an inflatable Santa Claus, waits to apprehend the thief. The next morning, the stolen treetop is returned to the Belcher family's Christmas tree, and Linda's Christmas spirit is restored. At home, Louise shows off her Barobu game card collection to her siblings, eager to complete it with some bootleg cards she bought online. Tina expresses concern over the plan's dishonesty, preferring to discuss their upcoming study session. At dinner, Tina tries to reassure her parents about her math skills by adopting a tough persona. Bob receives a call about Harry the pickle dealer's death and is asked to speak at his funeral, stirring up memories of a past incident he's reluctant to discuss. At school during study buddy time in the library, chaos ensues as Mr. Ambrose is distracted and Ms. Lobons steps out for a smoke. Louise, unable to wait until after school, convinces some classmates to trade Barobu cards behind a bookshelf. She recruits Tina as a lookout, despite her worries about getting caught. Meanwhile, at the restaurant, Bob feels uneasy as Morn and Teddy discuss plans for the upcoming service honoring Harry, a pickle dealer. Bob recalls a past incident where he upset Harry by criticizing his sweet pickles, resulting in a pickle-throwing altercation. 
At school, Louise and her classmates are caught trading the bootleg cards by Ms. LaBonds, who thanks Tina for informing her. Louise is furious with Tina for betraying her trust. Meanwhile, at the restaurant, Jean and Tina explain the situation to Bob and Linda. Linda defends Louise while Tina tries to apologize to Louise, but she remains angry. In preparation for his speech at Harry's funeral, Bob struggles to find an appropriate topic, as the farmers who witnessed his altercation with Harry will be present. Linda and Mort suggest pickle puns, while Teddy suggests singing Danny Boy with pickle-themed lyrics. At school, Louise tries to retrieve the bootleg cards from Ms. Lavonza's desk, but fails to find them. She then overhears Ambrose discussing plans for Martini Tuesdays at his apartment. That night, while Bob and Linda attend the funeral, Louise sets out to break into Lavonza's house with Rudy's help. Tina and Jean, worried about Louise getting into trouble, try to stop her but end up following her to Lubon's house. Tina attempts to repair her relationship with Louise, but Louise is determined to retrieve the cards. At the funeral home, Bob faces criticism from the other vendors and feels uncomfortable. Meanwhile, at Lubon's house, Louise, Rudy, Tina, and Jean observe the faculty playing a drinking game with the Barogu cards in the backyard. Louise devises a plan to retrieve the cards by lowering herself down from a tree using a rope tied around her waist. As the faculty continues their drinking game, the kids prepare to execute their plan to recover the cards. As Tina hangs from the hose, Labans becomes increasingly frustrated, unable to reach her due to her drunken state. Tina lies, claiming she orchestrated the plan and Louise tried to stop her. Labans is skeptical, but notices Tina's inability to climb the hose herself. However, Tina surprises everyone by actually climbing the rope to the tree branch. Lavon sarcastically acknowledges Tina's feet, but reminds her to report to the principal's office the next day. Despite the setback, Tina manages to retrieve the cards, and the kids successfully escape from Lavon's backyard. As Bob delivers his eulogy, he reflects on his actions and apologizes to Harry's pickle jar, expressing regret for throwing the pickle and acknowledging his role in the incident. Harry's lawyer then flicks a pickle in Bob's face, symbolizing forgiveness, and Bob responds with a mix of happiness and sadness, expressing his love for Harry. Later, as Tina, Jean, Louise, and Rudy walk home, Louise expresses amazement at Tina's bravery and reveals that Tina switched out the bootleg cards with the real ones. Grateful for Tina's actions, Louise apologizes for her previous behavior and promises to return the real cards to their rightful owners. Tina and Matthew Cathy both thank Louise and they share a moment of reconciliation before attending to Ruby's antics. Season 9, Tina's infatuation with Damon at Boys 4 Now Auditions leads her to disguise herself as a boy to meet him again. However, she becomes distracted by other boys and fantasizes about them while waiting in line. When she finally reaches Damon, she realizes she doesn't truly love him. Security catches her and she's kicked out of the auditions. Meanwhile, Teddy brings a baby rat to the restaurant and Bob, Linda, and the kids try to keep it hidden from health inspector Hugo. Despite some close calls, they manage to convince Hugo to leave without discovering the rat. Eventually, it's revealed that Boo Boo is the new member of Boys 4 now, disappointing Tina but providing relief for the Belcher family regarding the rat. Fran assigns the Belcher kids five hours of detention but offers them a chance to shorten it by helping with council con preparations. They agree to make a music video for him. Meanwhile, Teddy prepares for the local air show's paper airplane contest, hoping to win a washing machine. Despite many failed attempts, they discover Bob is the best folder and Linda is the best thrower, though Bob's throws tend to veer left. Fran and the kids film an old-school music video called The Empathize Glide, but the kids hate it especially Louise, who insists it shouldn't be seen by anyone else. Despite Franz's promise, the video ends up on display in the library, causing embarrassment. Confronting Fran, he explains it was an accident, leaving the computer logged in and angered, and the kids plan revenge. Louise devises a plan to humiliate Fran by getting him to trash-talk the other counselors at Council Con, and then broadcasting it to them. Meanwhile, Bob becomes dedicated to perfecting his paper airplane folding skills for the upcoming competition seeking out professional-grade paper for optimal performance. The kids successfully capture incriminating footage of Fran insulting the other counselors. Later, at an airstrip, they encounter Kurt, a seaplane pilot who used to give flying lessons to their mother. Kurt agrees to help them fly their revenge banner in exchange for their assistance in his own revenge plot. The kids sympathize with Kurt's desire for revenge against Lavern, but suggests a safer approach to seek justice. Tyner proposes that Kurt competes in the air show and performs the dice and slice maneuver to win. However, Kurt confesses that he's unable to fly upside down anymore due to trauma from the past incident. Louise offers their assistance in training Kurt to overcome his fear and regain his ability to perform aerial stunts. The Belcher family finds themselves in a series of misadventures. Louise and her siblings get involved in a scandalous school music video, seeking revenge when it's leaked. 
Bob and Linda prepare for a local air show's paper airplane contest, and the kids help a traumatized seaplane pilot confront his aerial stunt rival. Louise devises a plan to humiliate their school counselor, Mr. Fran, by catching him badmouthing colleagues. Meanwhile, Bob perfects a new paper airplane design after a dream encounter with a paper aviation expert. The family assists Kurt, a pilot, in overcoming his fear of flying upside down to execute a daring aerial stunt, but tensions arise when secrets about Kurt's family history are revealed. As Laverne and Kurt engage in a heated aerial confrontation, the kids, alongside Gus, try to intervene. Tina realizes that their father actually taught both Laverne and Kurt the dice and slice maneuver, debunking the notion of theft. Unable to communicate directly with them, the kids utilize a nearby grounded plane's radio to convey the truth. Louise, speaking over the radio, attempts to defuse the conflict, revealing that their father must have lied about the origin of the move. This revelation halts the fight and brings clarity to the misunderstanding. Meanwhile, Bob and Linda, unaware of the unfolding drama, watch perplexed as their kids unexpectedly become involved in the air show. As Kurt and Lavern reconcile mid-flight, the kids urge them to empathize and put an end to their feud. However, Kurt admits he's unable to fly the revenge banner himself due to prior commitments. Instead, he arranges for another pilot to carry out the plan, slicing the banner mid-air to prevent the counselors from seeing the embarrassing video. Meanwhile, at the hotel, Fran eagerly screens the empathized glide video as the banner plane approaches. Kurt successfully executes the dice and slice maneuver, thwarting Fran's humiliation. Back at the air show, Linda injures her arm during the paper airplane throwing contest, prompting Bob to step in. Despite his unconventional throw, they win a blender, much to their delight. Amidst their search for the valuable Netsuk at the Dumont apartment building, the Belchers find themselves entangled in unexpected encounters. Bob and Jean, mistaken for handymen, end up troubleshooting plumbing issues for a blind tenant on the third floor. Meanwhile, Teddy, Linda, Tina, and Luis search Kathleen's apartment on the first floor. Sparks fly between Teddy and Kathleen, prompting Tina to advocate for their romance. However, Linda remains focused on finding the net soup to help Teddy win over Helen. Their plans are interrupted when Helen unexpectedly arrives at the building, adding another layer of complication to their quest. As the chaos ensues at the Dumont apartment building, the Belchers navigate through a series of unexpected encounters and revelations. Helen, somewhat annoyed by the shared pursuit of the Netsuk, agrees to reward Louise for her find. Kathleen inadvertently discloses Larry's hidden apartment on the third floor, leading the group to discover his secret man cave. Meanwhile, Tina and Louise attempt to orchestrate a romantic connection between Teddy and Kathleen, despite Linda's persistent efforts to pair Teddy with Helen. Bob and Jean, still struggling with the plumbing, receive tools from Teddy without explanation. In Kathleen's apartment, Tina tries to foster a connection between Teddy and Kathleen, while Louise uncovers a clue about the Netsuit's whereabouts in the decrepit state of the building's infrastructure. With Louise's ingenious deduction, they locate the Netsuit hidden within the pipes, bringing their treasure hunt to a successful conclusion. As chaos ensues at the Dumont, the Belcher family finds themselves entangled in a series of mishaps and misunderstandings. Louise and Tina conspire to hide the Netsuit to manipulate Teddy and Kathleen into a romance, while Bob struggles with the plumbing, eventually causing a messy explosion. Linda becomes suspicious of the girl's behavior and discovers their plot, but before she can intervene, Teddy ends up in a precarious situation on the elevator roof. Bob and Jean manage to operate the elevator, but tensions rise when Helen prioritizes the net suit over Teddy's safety. As the situation escalates, Teddy narrowly avoids injury, but the net suit is damaged. In the aftermath, Linda and Tina apologize to Teddy, realizing their mistake as water leaks into Larry's apartment. The Belcher kids and their friends hatch a plan to avoid the mile run at school by biking to the ice cream parlor instead. They use a GPS tracker disguised as a cat's collar to monitor the slowest runner, Large Tommy, and sneak away from the running track to retrieve their bikes. However, Jean's bike chain breaks, leading Mr. Fran to make him run alongside Tommy for the entire mile. Meanwhile, Louise and her friends enjoy free ice cream at the parlor but are caught by Mr. Fran upon their return. Despite their efforts, they're ordered to run the full mile the following day, while Jean and Tommy complete their run as punishment. At the restaurant, Bob and his wife Linda call the Wharf Art Center in order to buy discount tickets for a show named Cake 2. Their regular customer Teddy tries to help them and later manages to get two tickets. Season 10, Tina and Bob prepare for the Thunder Girls' father-daughter cardboard boat race, hoping to avoid their past mishaps of sinking boats. Tina hints at wanting to win, possibly her last chance, but Bob remains optimistic as Team Tad. At the recreational center, Karen explains the race rules, hoping her role as judge will lead to a promotion. The race only permits cardboard, tape, and glue, prohibiting motors or gadgets. Bob and Tina notice Troop 257, 
who previously caused trouble, now participating. Aware the girls can hear, they diplomatically address the past tension. Meanwhile, the other dads eagerly seek their daughter's attention. At the restaurant, Linda excitedly shares news of the firehouse open house on Saturday, but the kids aren't as enthused. In the basement, Tainan's already cut the cardboard for the boat, asking Bob to write Tad on it instead of taping. However, Tina's perfectionism leads Bob to feel unnecessary. Tina overhears Bob's feelings and sabotages the tape to bring him back for help. On race day, Bob and Tina struggle with their boat's construction, worsened by Tina's meddling with the tape. They overhear Karen rehearsing to sound authoritative for Julian, who will be hiring a regional leader. Troop 257 mocks their boat as they pass by. Linda takes Jean and Louise to the fire station open house, much to their dismay, mistaking it for an event suited for younger children. Meanwhile, at the lake, Troop 257's boats pass inspection, while Tina and Bob's boat falls apart upon picking it up. Amidst the chaos, Rena gets stuck in a tree, prompting Karen to climb up to rescue her. Tina vents her frustration at Bob for ruining the boat, telling him to sit with his sad dads before storming off. At the fire station, Louise and Jean feel out of place despite Linda's excitement. In the woods, Tina discovers Troop 257's cheating and decides to confront them, prompting Patty to admit to their deception and urging Tina to inform Karen. Tina informs Karen about Troop 257's cheating with the motorized boat, but Karen decides to wait until after the race to address the issue in front of Julian. At the firehouse, the kids are unenthusiastic about the tour while Tina tries to convince Troop 257 members about their cheating. However, they dismiss her accusations as jealousy. Feeling frustrated and unheard, Tina confides in Bob, who believes her and realizes Karen's intentions. They conclude that Karen is working with Troop 257 to discredit them in front of Julian. Tina and Bob reconcile and devise a plan to switch the boats before the race. At the firehouse, Linda's enthusiasm for taking pictures of kids prompts the fire captain to sympathize with Louise and Jean's situation. He suggests staging a fake emergency call to allow Linda to experience the excitement she seeks. Meanwhile, at the lake, Bob and Tina execute their plan to switch the boats, with Bob orchestrating a distraction involving the fathers of Troop 257. However, their plan hits a snag when Troop 257's leader, Bethany, confronts them. After explaining the situation, Bethany reveals that Karen is being blackmailed by the Troop 257 girls, who know about her unethical actions regarding a lost pug. Understanding the situation, they collaborate to swap the boats for the race. At the fire station, an unexpected emergency call interrupts the staged event, much to the disbelief of Louise and Jean. Linda is torn between waiting for trucks to return and leaving with the kids. Meanwhile, at the boat race, Tina competes in the tad boat while Bob watches anxiously. When the race begins, Tina and Patty race fiercely, with Patty ultimately winning first place. However, when Karen attempts to accuse Patty of cheating with a the motor, they discover there isn't one. Confusion ensues and Julian expresses doubts about Karen's suitability for a leadership role. Tina congratulates Patty on her victory and Patty's father, despite his initial disappointment, ultimately embraces the moment with pride. Linda and the kids walk back to the restaurant, apologizing for driving them to the open house and saying she missed the old days but they outgrew it before realizing they're holding her hands to her delight. They arrive at the same time as Bob and Tina, who proudly displays her second place medal. Bob, whoever releases that since they were at the open house, no one was working at the restaurant that morning. Linda insists that they all hold hands outside the restaurant. The Belcher kids, particularly Jean, are dealing with lunchroom injustices and musical aspirations. Jean's frequent visits to the Hi-Fi Emporium and his desire for a drum machine cause tension with the clerk Dino. Meanwhile, Teddy's erratic behavior confuses Bob and Linda, especially when he reveals his new job at Jimmy Pesto's. At the restaurant, Teddy's accusations spark a heated argument with Bob, leaving everyone perplexed. At the Emporium, Jean's persistence annoys Dino, leading to a confrontation. Louise, fueled by her anger towards Dino, recruits her friends for revenge. Despite Tina's concerns, Louise is determined to get back at Dino. As tensions rise both at the restaurant and the Emporium, the Belcher kids navigate their own struggles and relationships with the adults in their lives. At the music store, Louise orchestrates a noisy disruption with Tina, Jimmy Jr., Zeke, Andy, and Ollie to annoy Dino, escalating tensions. Meanwhile, Teddy confronts Bob at the restaurant, feeling sidelined and accusing him of favoring Mort. Bob tries to reassure Teddy, but Mort's presence worsens the situation, leading to Teddy's frustration. In the store, Dino bans kids under 12 from testing instruments due to the chaos, disappointing Jean and prompting Louise to feel guilty about her role. Back at home, 
Jean vents his frustration to Louise about being banned from using the drum machine, while Louise, feeling remorseful, plans a revenge scheme against Dino. Linda intervenes, urging Bob to reconcile with Teddy and urging the siblings to stop fighting. Reluctantly, Bob agrees to apologize to Teddy. The next day, Linda and Bob observe Teddy working at Jimmy Pesto's, where Teddy's erratic behavior causes a scene with Mort. Teddy accuses Mort of sneaking fettuccine, but Linda notices the cup Teddy used, leading to further tension. At Wagstaff, Jean and Tina discuss Jean's desire to reconcile with Dino, while Louise joins them with a new plan to retaliate against Dino. Jean insists on handling it himself and forbids Louise from intervening, prompting her reluctant agreement. However, once Jean leaves, Louise recruits Jimmy Jer and Zeke for a glittery prank on Dino, leveraging Zeke's knowledge of Dino's dislike of glitter. At the restaurant, Linda encourages Bob to express concern for Teddy's job at Jimmy Pesto's, prompting Bob to agree reluctantly. Meanwhile, outside the Emporium, the kids set up a prank to glitter Dino, but their plan is jeopardized when Jean unknowingly heads into the store. Louise rushes to stop him, fearing he'll trigger the prank. Inside, Jean challenges Dino to a drum machine battle. As they compete, Jean surprises everyone with his creativity, but ultimately loses. However, Dino respects Jean's talent and offers him a monthly slot to play the drum machine. Teddy reveals his job at Jimmy Pesto's, leading to a confrontation with Bob. Linda convinces Bob to apologize to Teddy, deepening their bond. Meanwhile, Jean learns to handle his own battles and Dino extends an olive branch, granting him access to the drum machine. However, Louise's revenge prank goes awry, covering everyone in glitter. Season 11. Bob embarks on a quest to locate a lost lockbox key. The key is crucial for accessing important documents or items stored within the lockbox. Bob's quest takes him on a series of misadventures as he searches high and low for the missing key, encountering various obstacles along the way. Meanwhile, Tina endeavors to master a hand-slapping song that everyone else seems to be able to do except her. Despite her initial struggles, Tina's determination leads her to practice tirelessly until she finally succeeds in learning the song. At the restaurant, Teddy arrives towing an old drinking tub, which the kids decide to turn into their own swimming pool. Meanwhile, the Fiskoders propose a business deal to Bob. They want him to cook for the opening night of Calvin's new nightclub, Jazaret, while they search for a full-time chef. Bob reluctantly agrees after they offer a month of free rent. In the tub, Louise tells Teddy it's a gift for their parents inspired by Rudy mentioning Clove Barbash's pool. At the nightclub, Bob is impressed by the kitchen's clean and functioning appliances. Linda lands a duet with Mr. Fischoder for opening night. The next day, Bob preps for the opening while Linda stays at the restaurant. The kids plan a basement pool party, sneaking the tub into the basement with Teddy's help. At the nightclub, Bob clashes with Felix over menu ideas and discovers Calvin and Grover's plan to sell the kitchen once Felix loses interest in the club. That evening, Jen arrives to babysit as Linda heads to the club, and the kids pretend to go to bed to set up the pool party in the basement. Bob, heartbroken, reveals to Linda that the nightclub is a sham, causing Felix to leave angrily. Later, while somewhat intoxicated, Felix threatens his brother before storming off. In the basement, the pool party was awry as the tub starts leaking, forcing the kids to improvise with old hamburger buns. Meanwhile, Linda encounters Felix, who locks her in a closet with plans to sabotage the club during Calvin's performance. A drunken Felix inadvertently reveals his plan to Bob, who rushes to find Linda. The kids' attempts to soak up the water with hamburger buns fail, but they have fun playing in the mess. Bob rescues Linda just in time to stop Felix from destroying the club. Back at the restaurant, Bob apologizes to the kitchen staff and the Fiskoders offer free rent and an apology from Felix. As Linda and Mr. Fiskoder perform their do-it, the Belchers clean up the basement. The Belchers prepare for Valentine's Day at the restaurant, turning it into urge for the occasion. They promote the event, decorate the restaurant, and create a Prick's Fix menu. Despite initial concerns about low turnout, the restaurant fills up. With Bob cooking and engaging customers, Linda taking orders, and Jean and Louise entertaining guests. Hugo's unexpected visit briefly worries them, but they manage to pacify him. Meanwhile, Tina attends Tammy's party, trying to resist romantic temptations. Despite the success of Urge, Bob and Linda regret missing their own Valentine celebration. However, their spirits are lifted by the restaurant's success and the opportunity to express their love for each other publicly. As the night unfolds, tensions rise at both Urge and Tammy's party. Hugo's loneliness prompts safety concerns at the restaurant, while Tina struggles to resist romantic vibes at the anti-Valentine's gathering. The Belchers fabricate a story to placate Hugo, while Tana inadvertently disrupts the party's anti-romantic theme. Despite the chaos, Bob's restaurant thrives and Tina finds herself drawn to a boy named Austin. 
However, she flees before they can kiss, seeking to avoid romantic entanglements. Meanwhile, Bob and Linda contemplate the challenges of the evening, expressing their love for each other publicly. Cheryl's arrival resolves Hugo's loneliness, and the Belchers consider the future of their restaurant. In this episode, Tina eagerly anticipates a special father-daughter bonding moment with Bob, planning to watch his favorite old campy vampire sing-along movie together. However, Tina's plans take an unexpected turn when she decides to invite her friends, including Zeke, Jimmy Jr., Tammy, and Jocelyn, to join them. Meanwhile, Linda embarks on her own venture by opening a restaurant for the raccoons in the alley behind the diner. She sets up a makeshift dining area and begins serving them food, much to the bemusement of the rest of the family. As the story unfolds, chaos ensues both at the raccoon restaurant and during the movie night with comedic mishaps and misunderstandings aplenty. Despite the unexpected turn of events, the Belcher family finds ways to come together and make the most of the situation. On open house day at Wagstaff, Tina is tasked with running the AV table during the assembly. She inadvertently displays a hand in a dress dancing on the screen, much to Franz's dismay. In a flashback, Tina, as a hall monitor, tries to maintain order amidst a new craze sweeping the school, finger dancing known as handy prancing. Fran asks Tina to investigate and ban the activity to impress the superintendent. Tina struggles to gather information but eventually discovers the finger dancing scene in the boiler room, where Jean, under the alias Mavis Middlefinger, leads the performance. Despite feeling drawn to the activity, Tina agrees not to inform Fran about it. She grapples with her loyalty to her siblings and her obligation to Frond, torn between secrecy and honesty. Tina grapples with her conflicting feelings about handy prancing, torn between her enjoyment of the activity and her duty to stop it on Frond's orders. Despite her reservations, Tina gets caught up in the thrill of performing as Holly monitors her hand dance persona. Meanwhile, Linda tries to help Teddy sneak burgers into the movies for his date with Kathleen, while Bob's inventive burger-carrying vest fails to impress. Fran confronts Tina about her lack of progress in stopping the finger dancing scene, threatening to take away her vest. Tana denies tipping off Fran, but Luis suspects otherwise. When Fran discovers the finger dancing performance, he promptly bans it, leaving Tina feeling guilty and torn. Tana returns to her role as a hall monitor, but feels conflicted about being on the right side of the law after the ban on handy prancing. Unable to sleep, Tina devises a plan to showcase the finger dancing at the Wagstaff open house. During Franz's speech, Tina surprises everyone by playing a video of Holly monitors performing, much to Franz's dismay. Inspired by Tina's boldness, other students join in the finger dancing on stage. Despite initial apprehension, Tina's parents are relieved when Franz praises Tina's creativity rather than reprimanding her. Later, Jean confesses to Tina that he was the one who told Franz about the finger dancing scene. He apologizes for not being honest and joins Tina in a finger dance as Mavis' middle finger. With their bond restored, Tina feels a sense of closure and contentment. Season 12, Tina seeks comfort from Bob regarding her upcoming oral report with Zeke, triggering her fear of public speaking. Louise amusingly describes Tina's track record of botching presentations due to nervousness. At school, Tina struggles with escalating anxiety and accepts Franz Crystal, hoping it will help. Bob brings discounted produce to the restaurant, sparking debate over its value. In class, Tammy and Jocelyn's flashy presentation contrasts with Tina's nerves, until she surprises everyone by delivering confidently with the crystal's aid. Ms. Jacobson selects Tina and Zeke for the anniversary assembly presentation, along with Tammy and Jocelyn. Proud of Tina's progress, the family discusses the crystal's impact, while Linda explains their produce surplus. Despite efforts, the kids refuse the misshapen apples. At school, Tina guards Franz Crystal, seemingly aiding classmates like Zeke and Jimmy Jr. Luis suggests profiting from its perceived power. Meanwhile, at the restaurant, Bob plans to pickle surplus produce despite Linda's concerns. Tina's presence enhances classmates' abilities, but she decides to rest the crystal before the assembly, only to realize it's missing. Fran, preoccupied with the dinner date, urges Tina to find it. Luis suspects theft but finds nothing. At the restaurant, Bob defends his pickling efforts against Linda's complaints. Tina and Louise accuse Tammy of stealing the crystal, leading to a confrontation and its destruction. At the assembly, Tammy spots an opportunity, while Tina nervously admits to losing the crystal. Fran delivers a somber speech and Tina struggles through her presentation without the crystal. Despite her stumble, Tina's speech inspires Fran to take action. Bob and Linda reflect on their pickling venture, questioning its future. Jean and Luis celebrate Tina's bravery, using their crystal earnings for frozen yogurt. As Tina wrestles with her doubts, her conscience, embodied by Tina Bot, persists in urging her to proceed with her plan to destroy the wow or weird touchscreen. Despite her uncertainty, Tina ultimately decides to follow through with her mission, 
driven by a desire to put an end to the judgment and scrutiny surrounding clothing choices at Wagstaff. With a renewed determination, Tina prepares to carry out her plan, stealing herself for the consequences. The Belchers rush to the school to find Tina poised to smash the wow or weird touchscreen. Tina, feeling the need to rebel against unfairness after her horse shirt was mocked, refuses to leave despite her family's pleas. Bob offers leniency if she stops, but Tina's resolve remains. She opens the window to reveal her actions, surprising her family. Linda warns of expulsion, but Tina persists. As she's about to strike, Tammy interrupts, having entered the newsroom. Tina's family watches nervously, unsure of the outcome as Tammy witnesses the tense standoff. Tammy discovers Tina's plan to destroy the wow or weird screen and considers reporting her, but hesitates when Tina challenges the segment's judgmental nature. Bob and Linda intervene, urging Tina to accept the world's imperfections and find strength in vulnerability. Tina relents, deciding not to smash the screen. Yuli interrupts their conversation, but Tammy covers for Tina, revealing her own insecurities behind starting the segment. Grateful, Tina rejoins her family. Later, the Wagstaff Student News airs a segment on celebrity orthodontics, bringing a smile to Tina's face. At Bob's Burgers, Bob finds solace in customer compliments despite Teddy's ongoing graffiti investigation. Linda surprises Tina with grease-inspired pleather pants for her birthday, and the family enjoys boba drinks together. Meanwhile, Tina Bot reproposes the hammer to disrupt the memory-wiping process at the factory, leading to a joyous rebellion among the robots. As Tina grapples with her decision to destroy the wow or weird touchscreen, her family races to the school to stop her. While Tina tries to unlock the door to the broadcast room, her conscience urges her to follow through with her plan. However, she hesitates as her family's concern weighs on her. Meanwhile, Louise reads Tina's latest friend fiction entry, revealing Tina Bot's mission to disrupt the memory wiping process at Wagstaff Manufacturing. As Tina contemplates her next move, her siblings arrive at the school, desperate to prevent her from causing further trouble. Despite Tina's inner turmoil, her determination wavers as she realizes the impact of her actions. With her family's support, Tina must confront her conflicting feelings and decide the fate of the touchscreen. Despite their concern, Tina hesitates, revealing she hasn't yet destroyed the screen. Bob offers to delay punishment if she refrains from further damage. Tina explains her motive, citing the mockery of her horse shirt on the student news and her desire for a judgment-free world. Linda and Bob caution her about the consequences. As Tina deliberates, Tammy arrives, realizing her plan. Tina justifies her actions, prompting Tammy's sympathy after reflecting on her own insecurities. Bob underscores the inevitability of judgment and the importance of self-acceptance. Linda stresses resilience in the face of criticism. Tammy and Tina opt against destruction, choosing self-expression. After Yuli's departure, Tammy covers for Tina, sharing her vulnerability. Wagstaff's news subtly acknowledges Tina's influence. At Bob's Burgers, Bob finds solace in compliments while Linda gifts Tina pleather pants. The family enjoys boba with Tina's punch card. Tina resumes her journal. Meanwhile, Tina Bot sparks a whimsical rebellion in the factory. Bob and Linda's concern about Teddy's reliance on signs intensifies as Teddy's beliefs interfere with his decision-making. Linda reminds Bob to encourage positive interpretations of signs. The family's preparations for the comet viewing are overshadowed by Teddy's superstitions. Teddy's stumble is misinterpreted as a positive sign by Bob, further entrenching Teddy's beliefs. Meanwhile, Tina's attempts to purify her heart through apologies lead to mixed reactions. Louise's desire to collect wish papers adds humor to the situation, contrasting with the underlying tension. Linda's frustration over the lack of kettle corn underscores the challenges they face. As the comet appears, Fischroder's comical antics add levity to the scene. Teddy's struggle to interpret signs culminates in a confrontation with Bob, highlighting the clash between belief and reality. Despite the tension, the family finds solace in the comet's beauty, symbolizing hope amid uncertainty. Tina's quest for purity of heart continues as she tries to apologize to Tammy, but Tammy's manipulation backfires when Tina sees through it. Louise and Jean's antics with wish papers add humor to the evening's events. Linda's disappointment with a lack of kettle corn contrasts with Fischroder's whimsical behavior. Bob and Teddy's struggle with belief versus reality comes to a head as they confront their doubts under the cloudy sky. Despite the setbacks, Fischroder's antics bring a sense of whimsy to the scene. As the comet finally appears, Linda's encounter with Fiskoder leads to a comical resolution. Bob's recounting of the seal encounter offers Teddy a newfound sense of hope, prompting him to reach out to Kathleen. The family's final moments together, lighting their wishes amidst the comet's brilliance. In the midst of Jean's xylophone practice and Linda's distress over missing it for Tina's Thunder Girls play, Louise reveals her poetry contest is also that night. 
Bob and Linda are surprised, having assumed it was the next day. Louise suggests a plan for Linda to drop her off at the library en route to Tina's play. During the car ride, Tina tries to comfort Louise about her serious poem submission, recalling Louise's previous humorous entries. At the school, Bob and Jean encounter worried parents and meet Ms. Bissell Bender, the substitute music teacher, as Jean's regular teacher is absent due to appendicitis, much to Jean's disappointment. At City Hall, Linda assists Thundergirl leader Ginny with costume preparations while praising Tina's star outfit. Tina realizes Louise submitted her genuine poem, causing Linda to scream in shock. She informs Bob, who attempts to reach the library but ends up at the wrong one due to a misunderstanding with the taxi driver. Bob races back to the school just in time for Jean's concert, where the first song goes awry. Jean improvises by removing keys from the xylophones, leading to a unique performance of Philip Glass, Mishima slash Closing. Meanwhile, Louise delivers her heartfelt poem with Tina's support, earning applause from the audience, including Linda. On the car ride home, Tina teases Louise about her sincere poem. Jean's class receives a standing ovation, and Ms. Bisselbender concludes her substitute teaching stint. The episode ends with various scenes set to the melody of Mishima slash closing, including Bob reading Louise's poem and the Belcher children opening Christmas presents. The Belchers receive a $100 gift card, dividing it evenly before embarking on a shopping trip. Tina aims for a prudent purchase, while Jean seeks a slide whistle despite his fallout with Mitchell. Inside the Moore store, Linda imposes a $20 spending limit per person and sets a run of his time at the register. Tina considers a Boys 4 Now DVD but hesitates, while Louise eyes an archery set, attempting to persuade Tina to combine funds. Bob briefly entertains the idea of kettlebells before abandoning it, while Linda becomes fixated on a sewing machine. Jean encounters Mitchell, prompting reflections on their strained friendship. Meanwhile, Tina and Louise debate their purchases, with Tina ultimately deciding on a jigsaw puzzle. As tensions rise, Linda strives to convince the family to invest in the sewing machine. As the kids hide, Mitchell's departure brings relief. Tina defies Louise's advice and chooses a puzzle. They encounter Gene at the drums, but his reunion with Mitchell turns sour. Their noisy play attracts Bob and Linda's attention, leading to comical interactions with store staff. Linda tries persuading the girls about the sewing machine, but they remain firm. Tina spots a puzzle she wants, causing tension with Louise. Jean's encounter with Mitchell leads to hurtful remarks, upsetting him. At the checkout, Jean vents his frustrations. Louise arrives with the archery set, while Ten insists on her puzzle. Jean surprises with a game choice, but seeing Mitchell with the same toy triggers self-realization. The family comforts Jean, but his unease persists. Despite Jean's reconciliation attempt, differences with Mitchell remain. Bob praises Jean, but tensions linger. Louise's suggestion about extra money is met with resignation from Linda, who reflects on her love for sewing. Inspired, the kids reluctantly return their items and Linda rushes for the sewing machine, only to collide with kettlebells. Louise begins her school project on Amelia Earhart, but faces disruptions from classmate Wayne. Assigned by Ms. LaBonz, the class must create multimedia presentations about historical figures. At the library, Wayne dismisses Louise's choice, calling Earhart's legacy a publicity stunt. Despite Wayne's interference, Louise delves into researching Earhart. Back home, the Belchers discuss Mother's Day plans with Linda expressing a desire for a simple celebration. Intrigued by Earhart's disappearance, Louise contemplates changing her hero, but is discouraged by Ms. LaBonz. Bob shares his Mother's Day gift idea, a massage for Linda. That night, Louise dreams of outperforming Wayne academically, sparking determination to excel in her project. Jean inadvertently inspires Louise to use shadow puppets for her Amelia Earhart project. She seeks help from Benj, the puppet kid who initially declines due to time constraints. At the restaurant, Louise experiments with napkin shadow puppets and pitches the idea to Benj again, who agrees to assist her. With Benj's help, Louise creates paper cutouts for her project with her sibling's assistance. On Mother's Day, Linda overhears Louise's project concerns and encourages her to persevere, citing Earhart's confidence instilled by her mother. As Linda receives a massage from Pat, Louise vents about Wayne, prompting Linda to intervene. Linda's words inspire Louise to regain confidence in her project. In the end, Louise presents her project, highlighting Earhart's accomplishments and inspiring confidence in women. The class applauds and Wayne groans in regret. The credits show Louise and Linda collaborating on the project. The Belchers face tension when Bob and Linda request the kids to take on more chores. To bridge understanding, they share a bedtime story where Bob and Linda portray sheriffs in a western town, while the kids are townsfolk. Through storytelling, they explore underlying issues. Bob and Linda believing added responsibility fosters maturity, while Louise grapples with frustration over adult interference. 
The narrative sheds light on their concerns, with Linda revealing pressure from their grandmother Gloria to raise them a certain way. Moved by Linda's vulnerability, Louise apologizes and Linda reassures her, resolving to lead the town her way. They conclude that their town, symbolic of their family, is fine as it is, fostering mutual respect and understanding. Rudy braces himself for another tense dinner with his divorced parents and their new partners, hoping to ease the atmosphere with a magic trick. However, when the trick fails, Rudy flees the restaurant, finding himself at the Belcher household. Concerned, the Belchers invite him to dinner and discover he ran away. After contacting Rudy's parents, Bob prepares to take him home, but Luis volunteers to stay with Rudy at the restaurant for support. Bob and Linda admire Luis's compassion. Eventually, Rudy and Luis join his family for dinner, hopefully bringing some comfort to Rudy during the challenging situation. The episode begins as a home movie documentary about Louise's supposedly superhuman archery skills. However, the filming is interrupted when an odd-looking Teddy arrives, revealing himself to be a zombie. More zombified neighbors appear, prompting the Belchers to barricade themselves inside with Rudy, Ollie, and Andy. As the zombies break through, Louise discovers their weakness is mustard. Bob and Linda sacrifice themselves to hold back the zombies while their kids escape. However, Louise's fake archery skills are exposed when she fails to save Rudy, revealing she cannot draw the bowstring. The kids hide in Louise's room, where she discovers she can use her legs to draw the bowstring and defeats the zombies. Though they run out of arrows, they survive by covering themselves in mustard, ultimately impressing their family with their movie. Bob receives a distress call from Teddy, who's accidentally locked himself in a client's walk-in safe. Blindfolded during the car ride, Teddy's clueless about his location. Despite feeling uncertain, Bob employs deductive reasoning and Teddy's fragmented recollection to find and free him. Meanwhile, Linda and the kids welcome a victorious basketball team and decide to craft a colossal celebratory burger, the Beef Hamoth. However, its immense size overwhelms them. Later, as Bob succeeds in rescuing Teddy, the Belchers relish the leftover burger for supper, turning an unexpected situation into a memorable family feast. During a historical tour, Louise and Linda hear about the Jade Jellyfish, a hidden treasure rumored to be in Wonder Wharf. Louise suspects it's in the secret Fiskoder clubhouse below the wharf, known only to the Belchers. Linda, though skeptical, joins Louise in her quest for bonding and support. Despite encountering danger, they discover the statue hidden in a wall panel. However, Mr. Fiskoder claims ownership and sells it for a small sum. He gives Louise a share, and she proudly displays it above her bed. Meanwhile, Bob, Jean, Teddy, and Tina judge street performers for a vacant spot. They're moved by a humble performer playing PVC pipes, who shares the space with the others in the end. So that will be it from us. If you enjoyed the video, then do let us know about your favorite episode of the series. Also, leave us a like and subscribe to our channel for similar content. Thanks for watching. We'll see you at the next one.